Hello and welcome to the Today's Homeowner Weekly Podcast. We're here to help you with the challenges we all face as homeowners. I'm Danny Lifford. And I'm Joe Truini. And each week, Danny and I are here on the podcast to answer any and all home improvement questions. And we want to hear from you. Send us your questions or comments at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Okay, Danny, let's get started. Today's Homeowner Podcast is brought to you by The Home Depot, How Doers Get More Done. This week, we help a homeowner who's embarking on their very first home renovation and give her a few tips on how to level a bathroom floor. Also, what can you do about a hot garage? You drive that hot car in there, it stays hot. Well, there's a few things that you can do. We'll give you some tips along those lines. Also, we're going to check in with Chelsea Lipford-Wolf, who recently remodeled one of her bathrooms in her house, and she used a unique wall material that we got so many questions about, we thought we would revisit visit that. Also, we give you some tips on how to find the right contractor. We have so many people that are having trouble finding a contractor to do especially minor home repairs. We'll give you a few ideas how to find someone that you can be very comfortable to work with. Joe, what about that simple solution? I've got a quick tip on how to pull up concrete pavers if they've sunken too low or if they're cracked, you need to replace them because they're packed in so tightly on a patio or a walkway. Sometimes it's hard just to remove one, but I got a really easy way to do that coming up. Well, there's so many um, different types of paver patios and driveways out there. So stay tuned for that. Okay, let's get started. Right now we're going to Michigan. Lisa is on the phone. Lisa, welcome to the Today's Homeowner Radio Show. Thank you. How are you all? Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, we're doing great, and we're glad to have you on, and um, congratulations on rolling up your sleeve and getting ready to do a little updating on your home. We want to help you. What can we help you with today? Uh, my bathroom floor, it's been a nightmare. I have a 1926 home, and it's um, all the issues I've been running into with this home, and the floor is not left, and I'm trying to level the floor so that I can put the floor uh, I can install a flooring, the paneling over it, and I can't level the floor off. Okay, what kind of floor do you have in mind putting over the uh, uh, in the bathroom? Um, I purchased this porcelain like snap flooring to go together that yeah. I have to grout afterwards. Uh huh. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. But the floor is not leveled. It's just not leveled, and I've already I tried to level it, use the self leveling, but I didn't. I didn't go to the YouTube videos in time. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> that should always be the first step, Lisa. The second well, step is to call us. <laughs> well, the, 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 self, the self-leveling the self is a, is a little tricky. I mean, I... I know when I first used it the first couple of times, I thought it was a just an absolute miracle because I was only, you know, maybe an eighth of an inch unlevel. So I poured it out. It leveled itself up. I was ready to go in no time. I thought that was great. But when I used it on a project that was three quarters of an inch out, all of a sudden I had a bit of a mess because I had so much on one side of the room and nothing on the other side of the room. So it made it for, you know, a, a little harder. Do you have any idea how out of level the floor is? That's exactly what happened, what you just described the second time. So I done took a sledgehammer and broke it all up because it was so unleveled. I'm like, it made it worse rather than better. So I've uh-huh. broken that up. So, But do you think it's it, uh, one inch out or three quarters out? What, what do you think in terms of It's about an inch. I measured it. It's about an inch on one side. It's not the whole floor. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it's one side of the floor is like an inch, and the other side may be a quarter of an inch. The other corner is not the whole floor; it's just the side. I see. I see. Well, um, it, it's a it's a hard one to really uh, describe because, uh, you know. One way that I've done that, or actually many, many times where I've done that, is actually taking, um, and this is kind of tricky to do, but use treated wood and actually cut long shims to level it out. Now, this requires putting a level across it or a string line and measure where you're taking a piece of wood that may be six foot long and you're cutting it. Um, from three quarters of an inch down to nothing. So it's just these long shims that you screw and glue to the floor, and then you're basically Mm -hmm. putting a flooring on top of that. Now, that can cause all kinds of complications and lead to other problems, but it gets the floor level. But if the uh, are you replacing the tub in that area? No. 
Okay. So it depends on whether the tub is level or not. Hopefully it is level. And then, you know, when you level the floor, the, the tub's level, everything's fine. But it may also require you to do some work on the toilet flange if you have to bring it up to that level stage. But Joe, what do you think on something like this? Do you think maybe giving the, the, the self-leveling another try with using two coats, two applications instead of one? You know, Lisa, I would not bother with the self-leveling compound at this point. I would, I, and thanks for sending the photograph because that helps a lot. And that plywood subfloor of yours is in pretty bad shape. It looks like a small half bath maybe. I would take up all that plywood. Most of it's water damaged anyway. Um, I would take it all up. That would expose the floor joists below. You'd have a really clear idea on why it's so far out of level. It might be a damaged floor joist. It might be one joist that's way too low. And if that's the case, then I would recommend, as Danny said, making these long shims and out of pressure treated lumber, putting them right on top of the joist, and then buying brand new plywood, either exterior grade plywood or pressure treated plywood, half inches usually, two layers of half inch would probably be enough, um, on top of that. And then, um, and then it would be level. You'd have a brand new floor, um, plywood floor, subfloor. Um, and then you could put whatever you want on top of that. Now, as far as the toilet flange, there might you might have to adjust that, but there are lots of different products that mm -hmm. go in there. You know, this is not a common problem where someone puts a cup, takes out a thin floor, puts in a thick floor, and suddenly the toilet flange is too low. But they have they have um, toilet flange extensions that go right over that that you can adjust to get it perfectly flush with the new floor. So I wouldn't be concerned about that part. I would just get the plywood subfloor as level in all directions as you can and then worry about the toilet and any other areas first. After that, first, after getting the floor, the subfloor, nice and level. Okay. In order to do that, I would have to take out the tub? Um, no. I would, I would, if the, the plywood probably doesn't go under the tub, so that won't be an issue. Um, but no, okay. you wouldn't have to remove the tub. Um, and whatever's under the tub, it usually sits right on the floor, Joyce. So I don't think the tub would be an issue. Um, okay. I was just talking about the area I saw where the toilet was in your photograph. Yeah. That seems to be the... Yeah. yeah, I would just level it up from the toilet. Just go, is the toilet on the high spot or the low spot? The low, the back of the toilet on the low, because I actually... Um, I, I had to put some shimmies in to actually level right. the toilet off now because of the... Um, the self leveling that I put in there, I took, I broke it all up except for where the toilet is because I didn't want to take the toilet back out until I had right, a clear right. picture of how to fix it. Sure. Well, if it's if it's the low part, you have to put shims. If the if the, if the, the reason it's out of level is because the floor is too high at one point, then you have to trim down the joist or build up the other end. You know, but I don't know if you want to build it up an inch against the tub. I think I think you need a contractor in there, Lisa. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, that's why I said, you know what, just stop, because I literally have taken the floor back up twice already, and I'm like, no, just wait. You're, yeah. you're, you're not doing something right. Well, tear well, up the plywood and then have a contractor come out, because that's probably what he would do It is something a remodeling anyway. contractor does on a routine basis and uh, would be able to help you a lot on that. But either way, you've already... Um, You've already saved yourself some money by getting it to this point, and that way they can see exactly what they need to do from this point. So I think you're, I think you're in good shape. Sorry about the frustration so far, but I think you're on the right track. Thank you all so much. I, I you are a godsend. I, when I came across the videos and then went to your website, I'm like, I love this. <laughs> um, I, I stayed up last night watching a video on other things I need to do in the kitchen, the backsplash. I'm like, oh, my goodness, they're answering all my questions. This is awesome. <laughs> you all are awesome. Thank you. Hey, Thank we're you. we're, Thank we're you. glad to help, but if we can help you in the future, let us know. And best of luck on it, Lisa, and have a great weekend. Thank you so much. The same to you all. Time for our best new product segment, brought to you by the Home Depot, How Doers Get More Done. Now, if you wanted a smart thermostat, but you were afraid that most of the options may be a little too complicated or pricey, then I have something you need to consider. The Wise 7-Day Home Programmable Thermostat is maybe what you've been looking for. It's an easy, affordable way to transform your old thermostat into a smart one. The Wise app allows you to control your system from anywhere and even 
works with voice assistance to really simplify adjustments. Now, the thermostat also tracks usage and automatically makes recommendations to help you reduce energy. Plus, it boasts a zero learning curve for temperature control. It's as simple as turning a dial to raise or lower the temperature. So now, for more information on this WISE, and that's spelled W-Y-Z-E, seven-day smart programmable thermostat, all you have to do is log on to Home Depot. Dot com. Very often here on today's homeowner, we mention the different programmable thermostats, and and I'm not sure why people are resistant to installing one. Um, but it certainly um, it certainly is one that 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 you know a way that you can save money right. on the on you know on your heating and cooling bill because you're you know with programmable thermostats as a whole, you're able to really um, adapt your heating and cooling system to your lifestyle and that way you stay more comfortable and when you're not when you don't need that system working it's not working and that can help you quite a bit joe it just seems like uh this you know it's funny you know many many years ago with the smart technology yeah. uh, the smart homes and all of that concept came out and it required like a you know 15 miles of wire in your house and right. then as wireless came out it was introduced differently and then it started to where um uh, the wireless got to be reliable enough to use in a lot of different situations. Not only that, but it came with a technician that moved into your house to teach you how to use it. Yeah, I tell I you what it. caught my attention is the zero learning curve. I need that on almost every electronic I buy these days. Seems like every time you buy a new electronic, like even a new phone, like how much does an iPhone change from within two or three years? But it changes enough where you get a new phone. It's like, oh boy, okay, now I got to start all over again. <laughs> Hey, let's get uh, this uh, interesting email that we got in from Dennis in Pennsylvania. He says, we had a ranch-style ranch, ranch style home built in 2016 with an attached two-car garage. It was insulated and drywalled. In the summer, the days are between 85 and 90 degrees. And living uh, in the Poconos, it's not, uh, it's not the best thing to keep your garage door open because of snakes and other creatures. Wow, I didn't realize that. I put a fan on a wall, but that seems to just simply circulate the hot, humid air. Is there a way to ventilate the garage. I'm concerned about the mold and possibly enjoying the climate uh, there. So, uh, well, first of all, um, this is a common problem in all parts of the country where you're driving that hot, hot car in, you're closing the door behind you, you're running to your house. Well, that just acts like a, a heat generator to heat up not only hot but moist air in that garage. And yes, you're going to have mold and mildew. And yes, you're going to have an environment that's conducive for insects and termites and everything else. So what can you do? Well, the best situation I've ever seen. Now, you talk about um, here, Dennis, you have a fan. But yes, you have a fan that's circulating the hot, humid air in. What you need to do is to have a fan that moves that air out and thermostatically controlled. So find a wall that would be um, a perfect wall to install a 12 by 12 or a 16 by 16 exhaust fan. And that way um, you'll have that thermostatically controlled. And when that, you can set it at whatever, you can play with that temperature a little bit, and maybe you want to set it at 80 degrees. And then what happens is when that temperature in your garage gets up to that 80 degrees, it will turn on. The little louvers on the outside of the fan will open and then it'll exhaust that hot air. And now if you take this fan and position it higher up on the wall, you're getting where that hot air is rising. And I guarantee it's a it'll make a significant difference. Garages are not airtight. You have air around your garage door. That's where it's going to be pulling from. Even though it may be hot outside, that cooling, um, the, the, the cooling nature of that air moving through there is going to immediately exhaust that air. And it's not something you have to worry about turning on or turning off. Uh, Joe, you know, I mentioned uh, an invention idea, and I'll, I'll give away my idea, so maybe someone will grab it and go with it, right. um, in the garage door itself. Oh, I remember this, yeah. Yeah. So you 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 know how how you have the window inserts and so forth that wouldn't right. be the most attractive thing that you put in your garage door but if you were able to cut one of those panels out put a solar powered um uh exhaust fan there you know kind of like the solar powered um, attic exhaust fans you know they don't run real fast but they run real slow and steady 
I think that would be a cool little way to do it. Maybe you could do two of them and have them like painted like, I don't know, eyeballs or something. I don't know, something, you know, <laughs> that's where you drive up. <laughs> so, and, but anyway, um, what, what do you think in terms of uh, any other recommendation for Dennis to kind of cool that garage down? Yeah, well, installing, he says he has a fan on the wall. I assume he means a, a circulating fan built into the wall. Mm-hmm. And absolutely, if you can get one with a thermostat and a humostat, turns it on and off when you need it, that would be the best thing. Um, if you And he doesn't mention whether he has windows or not, but to just stick a fan blowing out in a garage with everything else closed up, you're going to have a little bit of a... As even though they're not energy super energy efficient, you're gonna have a little bit of a vacuum going on. So if you can, if there's a window on the other side of the garage, you can open up because you want to get a transfer of air. You want air coming in and air going out. That really helps out the fan. So if you don't, if you have a garage with two windows and you have this problem, open up both windows, put a fan in one window blowing out, and if you have a second fan, I guess you could put it in the second window blowing in. But even if you just open one window and on the other side of the garage have a window blowing out, that would help a lot. But as we said earlier, don't pull a, a really hot car into your garage immediately. And if you have to do that, then at least leave the door open. And so maybe some of that air will escape. Doing it yourself doesn't have to mean all by yourself. With the Home Depot as your partner, doing's never been easier. You can pick up skills online in a virtual workshop. Pick up what you need fast from easy in-store pickup lockers. Even have it delivered same day. Oh, and if you don't have time to tackle a project, our home services can do it for you. This is doing like never before. This is The Home Depot. How doers get more done. I'll tell you, last week we talked with Chelsea Lipford-Wolf about a new project that's part of her Chelsea Ranch revival. It was a bathroom that was being renovated, and the children will be using the bathroom, so it needed to be a little bit durable. We used a material called wet wall on the walls, and boy, did we get a lot of emails and a lot of people asking about what is it and, you know, how can it be used. So we thought we would revisit it in our Checking In with Chelsea segment right now. Chelsea, I'll tell you, uh, you've had the wet wall on the walls there for several weeks. Uh, What's your feedback and what do you think about it? Oh, we absolutely love it. And yeah, we did get a lot of emails and comments about the walls in the bathroom. But I even got some friends that came over and used the bathroom and they come out and they're asking, what's that on the walls? <laughs> so, that, I mean, that's it's it's always fun to have something that's uh, intriguing to people in your house. And that's because it looks like a natural stone on the walls. But of course, um, to the trained eye, you know that it's not um, because it's actually kind of like a laminate countertop. Yeah, it actually, uh, you know, of course, they've done such a great job over the years, Wilson Art, in simulating a lot of different types of finishes. And the finish here does have kind of a marbleized type look. But instead of it being um, on traditional uh, substrate and so forth, this is a waterproof core, I understand, that can be used in showers and bathrooms. And in this case, the entire bathroom. I think you're going to be glad you put that up there with those little rascal kids of yours. Yeah, I mean, we. We, we ended up doing it on all of the walls in our bathroom. Since it was a small bathroom, it wasn't that much extra work. Um, but you can just get the three panels that make up your shower alcove, if you will. And, I mean, that you can install um, in, uh, you know, about two and a half hours, which is a huge transformation you can make in a bathroom um, without um, getting out the, the wet saw. And, and, Chelsea, I understand these panels are about... 7 16th inch thick so they're pretty rigid and you just glue them to the wall is that right yeah that's right you um glue them to a flat surface and then um you apply some kind of pressure to maintain that bond while the adhesive sets up so you just had your husband brandon standing in the shower that's right i said here will you hold this wall for a second while i go tie my shoe (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> just like my dad taught me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, one of the things, too, when you're talking about trying to move a project along, whether you're a contractor, whether you're a homeowner trying to get it done in, you know, a limited amount of time, you know, you, you put uh, you put the drywall up on the wall, uh, but you don't have to finish it. And then you glue these panels and a little bit of caulking and you're done. So it's not like uh, some of the challenges that you have with drywall where you're installing the drywall, you put the first coat on. 
you're done. You can't do anything yeah. else in there. And then you put the second coat on. So sometimes that can be three or four days. Here, you can hang the drywall in most bathrooms and install this material in just one day. So you got a big time saving there, which, again, if you're a contractor, you're saving money. If you're a homeowner, you're able to get the project done quicker. That was also a big advantage, I thought, Chelsea. Yes. Uh, yeah, the time saving for sure. I also like that you can get a custom look without custom prices. And that's always a big, um, that's always appealing to people because who doesn't want their house to look custom to them and to be able to get these panels in different sizes depending on what size your room is, um, is fun. And um, the fact that it's dur durable, Dad, you know, um, having those kids, like you mentioned, um, you never know what kind of um, sports they might just be playing in the bathroom. Well, well, I know I was over there. We were doing a, uh, another project that you'll see on uh, the Today's Homeowner Television Show coming up. We were over there this week working. I heard this knocking. I couldn't figure out, well, what's this mm -hmm. knocking? Well, it was little Gus with a truck banging it on that wall. And uh, so I'm not sure <laughs> why, but um, it held up very well. And if, they, if that had been a drywall um, surface, uh, someone would be in there with a little drywall compound, a little touch Yep, it wouldn't paint, be but... me. He'd be learning how to um, do drywall compound <laughs> real right. fast. He, he He's four years old. He's old enough. Why That's not? right. Yeah. <laughs> well, we just wanted to make sure that we revisited this. Want to tell you how you can get more information. First of all, if you want to know more about Chelsea's Ranch Revival, go to todayshomeowner.com slash ranch revival. If you want to know more about um, the process that went into this, you can go to checkinginwithchelsea.com. Yeah, that's and right. I have a whole new video just on the walls in our bathroom. Oh, that's right. That's just been released. That's a perfect way to see exactly what that's again, checkinginwithchelsea.com. And you can also go to wetwall.com. And wetwall is a um, company that's part of the division of Wilson Art Company. So you know the qualities there and they They'll definitely stand behind each and everything. Chelsea, thanks so much for being with us once again. I know you're right in the middle of that big living room project, so I'll rejoin you on that really soon. All right. We received this email from Sandy that says, I'm having trouble finding a contractor to do some minor home repairs. Do you have any suggestions on how to find competent contractors? Sandy, this is a frustration that people are experiencing, have for decades, will for decades, and it's just an unfortunate situation. But... The thing to do is to take your time, and I think one of the best ways to go about this is really to ask around. And I also see a lot of people are doing the, the let's see, what is it, IOS in search of, ISO in search right. of on Facebook and other social media platforms, asking recommendations from friends and acquaintances for someone to do handyman work, for someone to do plumbing, electrical, and everything. That's another way to reach out to people that have had good experience with contractors, and that's probably one of the best ways to do. Another one uh, that we recommend a lot and have for years is the Home Builders Association. Uh, it's a national organization, and they have a, an associates list which is the associates are um, all of your trades, your plumbers, electricians, uh, drywall finishers, and so forth. And that's another source to call up the, your local home builder chapter and say, hey, I'm a homeowner. I'm looking for two or three names of electricians, handyman, or wherever, and uh, let, let, let use that resource to get some reputable people and then talk to several of them. You certainly want everything in writing. You want to make sure they have insurance. Do all of the due diligence that you need to do for that so that you have a good experience. But those referrals are one of the best ways to go. And um, I'll tell you, another one is real estate. The real estate community, if you've worked with a realtor or know somebody that's a realtor, um, they use handyman and people like that every single day. They may be able to recommend someone. Yeah. In fact, I've found two really great contractors from my friend who's a realtor, one, a well guy, a well contractor to come and work on our well. And the other thing is, uh, as far as getting recommendations, when you hear a friend is doing a remodeling project, you know, ask him or her, like, are you happy with the work? And who's, I always ask, who's the plumber? Who's the electrician? Who's the framer? Because if they had a happy experience, you know, I like to know who these people are. Because, you know, sometimes the plumber I want to hire is not available. Um, so it's nice to have another another uh, name. So and, and what happens is you end up with the names of two or three plumbers, two or three electricians. And then, and now I've gotten to the point where I've lived in this town long enough that people are starting to call me. All my friends and family are calling me who live nearby looking for a tradesperson. And I can always pass along a name. So 
yeah, ask around, you know, um, personal reference is always the best way. Um, if someone else has hired this person, had a good experience with them, then, you know, I feel happy having them coming into my home. We want to make sure we get our simple solution in, Joe. So shifting gears to that, what do you have for us? Okay. This one is how to pull up pavers. We were talking earlier about um, concrete pavers Mm -hmm. and how sometimes they settle. I had one where a chipmunk got underneath my patio and took out all the dirt (laughs) and the thing caved in a little bit. So, But it's sometimes hard to pull up. So here's how you do that. Take a clothes hanger, cut two pieces about 10 inches long, and with pliers, bend one end about one inches long, one inch long, and the top end maybe four inches long. And those bends are going out at opposite directions. Do is you, the one inch long section is like a finger. You slip it down between the pavers and you rotate it 90 degrees so the little fingers slip under the paver. Then you just yank them out. As simple as that. And then you could prepare the soil or replace it or whatever you need to do. But that's it. Just use the clothes hanger with a little bent end to slip under the paver. Doing it yourself doesn't have to mean all by yourself. With the Home Depot as your partner, doing's never been easier. You can pick up skills online in a virtual workshop. Pick up what you need fast from easy in-store pickup lockers. Even have it delivered same day. Oh, and if you don't have time to tackle a project, our home services can do it for you. This is doing like never before. This is the Home Depot, how doers get more done. Now let's tackle a few of the emails that we received this week. And you can send us one by going to todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. This came from Mindy in Virginia. When landscaping, is it better to use landscape fabric or no landscape fabric at all? Well, I'll, if you're if you're battling those weeds, that landscape fabric can certainly be a, a, a big advantage for you. So, you know, even if it's an existing flower bed where you already have plants in place, just scrape away all of the mulch that you have, go ahead and remove the weeds while you have all of that away from it. Then carefully lay down a good quality landscape fabric, cutting it in tightly around all of the plants, get it laying nice and flat, and then return the mulch and add additional mulch if you need to. Uh, there are There's also other um, amendments that you can add, uh, different types of uh, very passive products that will also help fight those weeds. But the main thing is definitely the landscape fabric will help you considerably. Joe, here's one for you from, okay. how about this one? This is from Ireland. This is oh, Angela wow. that is listening to our podcast there across the big pond. How do I keep limestone, my limestone mantelpiece uh, clean um, over my gas fire? So you know how gas will have the residue right. sometimes. And it also has some candle wax stains. What do I do? Maybe she's burning peat. They still burn peat, those little lines of peat? Know. I think they might. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, limestone, you know, it's pretty porous and it's pretty soft, so you do have to be careful when you're cleaning it. You don't want to be too aggressive and scratch it up. Um, first, you could buy a stone cleaner. They do make one. Bona, B-O-N-A, makes one. Simple Green. They, both of those products are, are very mild, but they, you know, they won't damage it, but, they, but they'll help clean it off. Or you can simply scrub it with, any, with warm soap and any mild uh, liquid soap, so warm water, rather, and, and mild liquid soap. You don't want to use anything acidic, nothing. We often recommend citric-based um, cleansers, but don't use any, anything that has like orange or lemon oil or anything. That might be too strong. And if you want to remove the stains, one of the best things to remove stains from any stone, including um, limestone, would be hydrogen peroxide. Mix it up with um, a little water or, or vinegar to make a paste. Smear it on, let it sit for a day or two. And then once it's dry, you can just scrape it off with a plastic putty knife and clean it. That's, that's about the best you can do. Um, for uh, staining on a stone mantelpiece. You know, that's one of the cool things uh, that are happening with the internet, that people from all over the world are able to yeah, listen amazing? to today's homeowner and, and uh, listen to our podcast and so forth. We get a lot of emails from all over the place. It's very, very interesting. But now here's our podcast question of the week from Susan in California. I recently had my roof replaced. The quote doubled after they saw termite damage. I noticed they charged me for plywood, but actually used a much cheaper material called OSB. Now, that's oriented strand board. Now, does this hold up as well? I'm also concerned about the silverfish will destroy it as I understand they love glue, which is a huge component of OSB. Should I ask for the difference back since I was charged for plywood? Well, boy, the you, you can get into a lot of uh, 
opinions when you talk about the quality of plywood versus OSB. And I'd certainly feel very comfortable in saying, I try not to use OSB on anything. I'm a big um, a big fan of true blue plywood. Now, it's very straightforward. If they charge you and it says that they're putting plywood on and they used um, OSB, which is a different material, I would ask for that money back and question very strongly why they did not adhere to the contract um, on this. Joe, what do you think? It's, you know, and of course, there's different qualities of plywood, different qualities right. of OSB. So there's more than just a, you know, straight black and white question here. But what, what, do, you, what do you think in terms of the overall question? Well, I mean, the reason you have a contract is so they spec the materials, so you know exactly what they're putting in. And if this was, you know, they said they were going to put in 5 8 inch plywood and they put a half inch plywood, I mean, all right, well, whatever, that's probably fine. But OSB is, I don't know what the prices are these days because they're kind of crazy, but it's typically half the cost. So, you know, I mean, that's considerable when you're doing a whole roof. Um, And I agree with you. I would never use OSB, I don't care what it's rated for, on for roof sheathing. Um, plywood is much better at, at resisting moisture. Um, putting it on sidewalls, you know, sheathing walls, you know, OSB is fine, but not for a roof. So I would, I would definitely recommend uh, using plywood and and asking about the difference in money and why she shouldn't get that back. Because again, the price it's not an insignificant when it's double the cost. It's not an ins- insignificant amount of money that she she put out and she's not getting the product. I guess it's easy just to tell them uh, either you give me my money back for the difference or right. replace it with what you said you were going to do. Right. Yeah. You know, so it's just a uh, boy, I hate to hear those kind of things. And Susan, I hope we've been able to help you on that. We appreciate uh, you sending in your question and hope that does um, help you resolve the situation with your roof. Roof is a very somewhat permanent uh, component to your home and every aspect of it should reflect that longevity. So I hope that works out very well. Now, Susan sent us this question by going to today's homeowner.com slash podcast and would encourage you to do the same. Hey, we talk about reviews. We have another review here uh, from Upstate Pete says uh, the podcast <laughs> is informative and entertaining. Great to listen to get your ideas. Your email the the e- you answer the emails very well. Keep it going, Danny and Joe. Thanks so much, uh, Upstate Pete. Uh, I love that from love Downstate that Joe. You thank have. you very much. Absolutely. And we would encourage you, if you have a moment, to uh, uh, write us a comment. Uh, and again, you can send those comments to todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. But we'd love for you to include those on reviews that you leave for us um, as well. We really appreciate you being with us each and every time here on the Today's Homeowner Podcast. I'm Danny Lipford, along with my buddy Joe Truini. Thanks for listening to this Today's Homeowner Podcast. <music>